You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. So be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike, options pricing and analysis software. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. Visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody, that music means it is time once again for TWIFO, This Week in Futures Options, the program where the name says it all. We break down the week that was and indeed still is on the futures options side of the fence. So maybe we'll talk some ag, some energy, some metals, maybe some equities in there. You never know. Lean hogs, you never know what's going to make it on the board. That's why you got to tune in every week. My name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsSider.com. So as of course, I'm the ever-exciting The Options Insider Radio Network, pleased to have you with us here on this fun, fun program. Our old friend, Mr. Sean, traveling hither and yon again. I believe he's in Munich for the Risk Management Conference right now. He's promised to bring back some tasty, delicious Bavarian pretzels and maybe some schnitzel and all sorts of good stuff for the studio next week. So we'll look forward to that. But joining me to hold down the fort this week, our old friend, we wrestled him back onto the program, Mr. Nick Howard, the CEO of Bantix Technologies, a.k.a. the creator of Quick Strike, a.k.a. the most beloved, I should say, curmudgeon in the futures options marketplace. Mr. Howard, welcome back to the show, sir. It has been too long. Yeah, it was uh, it was a welcome, nice summer break for me, but uh, I'm back for the time being. But, you know, it might be you'll be playing Where's Nick maybe pretty soon. Who knows? See what happens. You know, they don't call you the beloved curmudgeon for nothing, sir. I'm glad Where's to see you. Where's <laughs> yeah, the curmudgeon? Yeah, there you go. Where's the curmudgeon? That's what we need. Where is the curmudgeon on the show this week? And also joining us, holding down the CME Group hot seat today, is uh, making a return appearance here. Actually, on the program, Mr. Adam Webb, the founder over there at Macro Hedged. Adam, welcome back to Twifo, sir. Hi, thanks very much for having me back. 
in spite of what Nick said, Nick said we can never bring you back on. I said, no, he was pretty good last time. I think we can bring him back on. So we'll, we'll give you another trial run here. Don't listen to what that Nick guy says. He's a curmudgeon for a reason. <laughs> all right. With the gang all here, then let's, let's get going. Let's dive right on into it. Let's break down the week. What's moving first? Then we'll get into some more specific products in a minute. By the way, you guys can find all this for yourself, cmegroup.com slash twifo, T-W-I-F-O. You can generate all these reports for yourself. Follow along, play the home game if you like, or, of course, head on over to bantix.com to, to play the pro game over there. And if you do that, you look for this week. Remember, change your settings to look back over this week and see what's going on. You'll see the big movers. Let's look to the upside first. Let's be positive. Uh, number five to the upside this week. Again, this is just pure underlying. No uh, no volatility, no open interest, nothing like that. Lumber up about 4.5%. Nat gas up about 4.65%. Number three, oats up about 5 and a third percent. Number two, our old friend Iron Ore keeps popping up there. Not much of an option story there, but interesting underlying story there. About 8.25%. And number one, with a bullet this week, Class 3 Milk, our old friend, Class 3 Milk, dominating the tape here this week. Eight and 8.28% to the upside. Let's go to the downside now to the dark side here. Number five, our old friend WTI. We'll be getting into that in a minute. Down nearly 3%, 2.82%. Not exactly a boon week for all things crude. Number four, Lean Hogs, off over 3%, about almost 3.2%. Silver. After getting all that love to the upside, giving some of that back up this week, down three and a third percent. Uh, number two, the old Ultra Bond up down, or excuse me, down about three and a half percent. And number one, to the dark side, the euro, euro dollar there off about five and a third percent. But let's get into it. Uh, since we got our buddy here, Adam, joining us, he likes to, likes to make them markets over there in WTI, talks a lot of WTI in his chat room first. Let's start in WTI land. Adam, sir, what is lighting up your tape? What's catching your eye out there in WTI these days? I think this this week's been a, a interesting uh, interesting developments. I think the obviously it got a kind of the, the draws came in as everyone expected. The usual ramp up in uh, September. Uh, I think the the surprises that have come out for the market is a couple of things to kind of bear in mind is uh, the the nervousness of OPEC around uh, U.S. exports. U.S. exports have really got to get themselves up from this current 2.9, which they're looking like they're going to hit about 3, 3.5 by the end of uh, end of the year. And the, the kind of when you kind of cut through all the junk that's come out of OPEC and everything else in the last uh, 72 hours, the one for me is them hunting around for a further 400,000 barrels of cuts uh, uh, or they're now, or they're calling it compliance, um, which is the new term. Uh, the 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 kind of the key thing for me there is uh, keep, keeping your eyes peeled on, on OPEC. Really, are trying to match off um, what the US will export in addition because of the draws that are coming out of Cushing as well. I think there's a, I mean, uh, I think there's an interesting play that uh, the Brent WTI spread co- comes in uh, between now and the end of the year. Might, maybe not a lot, but we're at four, four and a half bucks at the moment. I could come in as much as to, down as much as to two bucks, which would be an interesting thing. Don't think the options market's pricing anything for that at the moment. But all I've seen the last few days is continued upside. I think people are seeing this uh, political uh, sell-off and the, and the noise from Russia today as an opportunity to scoop back in. We're still going to see draws out of Cushing. Um, I think the fun and games do, doesn't start until first week of October, in which case at that point it's uh, seat belts on. It's going to get wild. Last time you were on, you said the market was taking every opportunity, any little blip, anything they could to dump some upside and to, and to sell those calls because it didn't seem like there was any, any upside love. Are you saying that's reversing itself a little bit now? People are scooping some upside now on the heels of this OPEC-driven sell-off? No, the guy, this, this longer data stuff, you know, the calls are still getting crushed. I just think from a seasonal perspective, you know, we tend to see if you just get any kind of apart from 2014 when the big sell off came, when the tax went on. Um, usually this 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 period of time, the September second week in September through till first week in October, seasonally quite a, uh, a, a, a bullish period of time for WTI and Brent. 
I think you know the the noise coming out of Iran as well that you know that they're exporting a lot less. So they managed to sneak out half a million. Um, they, they, I think they'll 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 keep the rhetoric going to keep the price up because it's hard to hold it back when uh, when the when the winter builds start coming. So I think the the longer term guys. Uh, the longer term guys are kind of they're coming in and uh, and and they're, and they're 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 basically looking uh, at pushing out kind of November December time, but the the short the shorter term plays at the moment are for this to kind of reverse and come back up. It is a fascinating one to watch, Mr. Nick. I know a large chunk of your users still living out here in WTI. What's been catching your eye since the the last time you gathered here with us on the show? Uh, well, I'll throw a question or two out to Adam for for a second, if if it's okay, because uh, um, again, I've been I've been on the sidelines a little bit, um, paying attention, but mostly just trying to get stuff going on over here and taking a little bit of uh, uh, summer break where I could. But you know, Adam, back uh, back about back a few days ago in the WTI, we saw we saw that push up into the 50, around fifty eight. Uh, um, or so. So, yeah. what, what what what's some of this choppiness? Where is it coming from? I know it's I know that's it's a lot of the talk that you that you had mentioned. But you know, when you look when you look a month ago, and we're right back where we were, so almost a month ago. But we we have had these spikes and then these reactions back down. I mean, is that just because people keep keep changing the talk? What what's going on with? That? I think I think we we are we're in a fairly kind of tight range. And if you kind of look at the kind of bigger macro picture, you know, su- supply is increasing, you know, p- you know, the, the, the kind of three month out to 12 month view is, you know, the, the demand of, of crude is going to is going to decline. OPEC's got a problem of, of plugging the gap. The U.S. is for briefly, I think, for a mid part of last week was the world's largest uh, uh, producer. Uh, and I think I think we're we're seeing we're seeing some scrambling to rebalance now. Put all the political kind of junk to one side for a moment, uh, and so so the OPEC struggling to, to rebalance the market anyway. And then all, what we're seeing at the moment is, is is just that political uncertainty. You know, all of a sudden crude decides to follow the the S and P five hundred, then it's not. Then then we see you know changes in the White House administration. Uh, I think Bolton, what, you know, we've not really recovered from Bolton news. We've not really recovered uh, from, from, you know, the, the the rumor of Trump wanting to make a deal with uh, with Iran. So we've got we've got some the the markets is trying to make some stability, but we've got the in, the political instability around that at the moment. I think that, that that's what's creating the chop. No, no, that was that was uh, that was the one thing I want to ask. And then do you you know you you talk about where there'll be some changes coming now that we're moving into the different um, weather pattern potentially here any anything else out there from from that standpoint that could be interesting? yeah i mean there's a few you know it's still a, 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 a kind of good trade is i think the uh i think because of an interesting change in the market at the moment is where we will be surprised after after october of what could potentially be some some continuing draws on cushion and I think we'll see the spreads well supported. I think, uh, which is an unusual period, we normally see that backwardation stretch pu- get get pushed a bit. So you see all the spreads blow out a little bit. So that could be there's, there's some interesting plays there. And you know, I think we've, if if we listen to this back in when we you know roll forward in time to February next year, I think that that people will look and say, hey, we you know that that was we were, so we saw surprising draws because of the the change in uh, in some structural changes going on in uh, around Cushing. Uh, uh, and the builds moving around the exports off pad one and pad two. I think I think we that that could be a really profitable play, a low risk profitable play because you could spread it out um, between between the uh, uh, December expiry through, out through to the March expiry next year. That could be an interesting play, especially in the option space. Let's get into some of those options and see what was lighting it up out here. You know, you've been talking about. What's been setting the stage on the political front? Let's give our listeners a bit of a refresher. Obviously, we had OPEC back in the crosshairs again this week. Uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I guess depending on your viewpoint, there no real decision over there on on more supply cuts out of OPEC. They kind of instead have been focusing on bringing some of their recalcitrant members into line over there with Iraq and Nigeria and a few others. ECB, of course, cutting rates this week. That also. 
putting a little bit of pressure out there on the energy space. And the Saudis coming out and saying, effectively, they're going to punt the ball a little bit. They're not really planning on any big decisions on big cuts before their next meeting, which is not until December. So again, not a lot of near-term upside momentum there for the marketplace here coming into showtime here we're seeing wti off not not surprisingly off yet again we mentioned it it was one of our big movers and shakers to the downside this week it's still off over three percent a little bit shy of the 55 handle about 54 and three quarters or so looking at what was lighting up out here from a vol perspective remember we said before WTI and energy in general is kind of maybe a bit of an unheralded play from a volatility perspective. We've had a few guests on now talking about how it's growing more attractive as it, to an analyze and watch the volatility of the space. And certainly WTI volatility has not disappointed. It moves and shakes on any given week. This week, it's another upside move here. We're seeing it net up and up pretty strong, up about four handles in that nearer portion of the term structure coming off obviously a little bit less as you go a little bit farther out. In terms of where the action was, it was all pretty much about half of all the paper this week coming in that Ock month here. And looks like it was pretty much a close tie. It was about a couple hundred contracts different between the Ock double puts and the 58 calls. The double puts taking it by a nose, actually a few minutes ago, a few hundred more going up, pushing it into the number one category here with about 22,000 contracts this week. The lion's share, kind of a bit of a tie between Tuesday and Wednesday, a little bit north of 7,000 each, followed hot on its heels by the 58 calls, 21,600 of those, the lion's share of those coming on Wednesday, nearly 8,000 there. Slightly opening, slightly closing on one or the other, not a ton of bias in either direction, both fairly active strikes. As you might imagine, we were kind of vacillating in those range this week, and people were wondering, maybe we get some upside, maybe we're going to retest the lows. The puts winning out, but by a very, very a narrow margin. Also action on the 50 puts, so again, that's not surprising. Even money, even kind of strike level puts tend to dominate the narrative out here in WTI, and that seems to be the case again this week. Almost 21,000 of those 50 puts going up out here this week as well. Again, most of the action in Ock. Let's just scroll down here a little bit, see if we find any other exotic trades going up. 7,000 of the 50 puts also going up in Deese this week. If you like upside, 70 calls were the go-to trade out here for not a small amount here. It looks like about it's almost 7,000, 6,600 or so out here in February as well. So not all downside, mostly downside, but not all downside. You could get a little bit of upside action here as well. And, you know, Adam, you can make an interesting comment before I want to come back to that a little bit because we, we touched on it before on the show, but we won't get a chance to spend a lot of time on it because it isn't, like I said, a huge option story. But if you're trading WTI, that WTI Brent spread is obviously of interest. You mentioned that's kind of an interesting one you're, you're watching these days, Adam, Then maybe that spread you think coming in? Yeah, it, it is It is of interest. Um, and uh, um, the, 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 the kind of key reason is, you you could overlay some some fairly decent risk uh, with the either independently trade the legs um, uh, through through a Brent option and through a WTI option, or you can uh, or you can or you can put or you can actually trade the spread option itself, um, which is becoming more and more popular. It does tend to be going through blocks more than anything else. But yeah, it's a good it's it's there's there's some nice plays out there. Mister Nick, anything on Brent WTI, sir? You know, to throw some to throw some other light on on the WTI here. And again, I've been I've been watching, but I I, I haven't been in the thick of it. And, but I, I have been talking to Adam and Hugh and listening to what they have to say. But some some things to take note of. I mean, um, if you look, and we don't talk too much about this, but if you if you go and look at uh, QuickVol and uh, uh, and and take a look and see what's happened in the in the let's say the October contract, for instance, as just as an example, um, you know, we've, we've stayed in a fairly, we've had some movement volatility wise. If you go back to the beginning of August where we were around the mid thirties and we moved up a little bit above 35, but we've kind of bounced around between 30 neg 30 and 35 uh, from an implied vol standpoint for that OC contract. As an example, that OC contract right now has um, five days to expiration. So let's, let's just, jump out to the November just to give some, a little bit better perspective. So it'll give us the 60 to 30. But we haven't had a lot of movement in the implied volatility of the market. But what's interesting, and I don't, and I, and, and I don't know how much I rely on this for anything, but the, 
the 20 day historical or the one month historical volatility has been all over the, I mean, been really much higher. So the implied really didn't follow the, the activity uh, of the market so much. And again, that's the implied of that, the money and and that's it, in this movement between the, uh, between these futures prices of 50, 50 and 58, um, you know, we had, we're probably in the little bit of the belly of the vol curve, like we talk about, right? Uh, it's, it's got a, there's, there's a little bit of a smile to it. It's tilted um, right now. But uh, we, the, the vol itself didn't follow the, the, the volatility of the market. The options volatility didn't follow the volatility of the market. So that, I think, is a, a, a pretty interesting uh, look at what's going on. Also, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of what we're seeing here, and I'm just going to run through a few of them, you know, we, we, have, we have movement, we have a little bit of a bid in the volatility, but we're, getting, we're catching a little bit of that bid with the market moving lower, right? Because right now we have a put skew uh, in, in most of these vol curves. So as we move lower, we're going to get a, a little bit of an increase in volatility. So again, make sure you look at that shift and slide column where you're going to see how much is because the market moved down and how much is because the market actually moves from an implied volatility standpoint. So with this move down from... Uh, the highs of 58 and change, you know, we're going to see increased volatility, but a lot of that increase was coming from the fact that it was just sliding up uh, the put skew there. So those are the things that really that I'm, I'm still paying attention to. May, I may not be the macro education uh, um, uh, oriented here, but I'm still looking at the numbers. And, and that's so those are some things to um, uh, to take away from that. As far as uh, and I'll throw this over to Adam too, because I know this is what him and Hugh are always looking at over at Macro Hedged. Um, you know, we've seen some changes uh, in the skew uh, this last week, and mostly it's been not so much that the the, the it's the, the calls have gotten caught a little bit of a bid, and the puts have been a little bit offered, not a tremendous amount, but enough to give us a little bit of a change in the uh, in in the tilt. Of the curve, so Adam, you got anything on the on the oil skew that you want to touch base on, or if anything looks good, it looks kind of to me just looking at the thirty day and the sixty day, the channel looks kind of steady over the last couple of months. But uh, yeah. so I, don't, I don't necessarily it's, think there's anything there, but maybe you can add some light. It's been pretty dull, to be honest with you. I mean, kind of we, uh, you know, outside we we've not put a crude trade on at Macro Hedge for a while because we have just been kind of stuck in that range. There's been no real value. There's a little bit. Um, our Bob upside is still pretty cheap. Uh, heating oil uh, is is still pretty cheap upside. There's some really interesting uh, bend in the skew there. I mean, you, to get any size on, you're going to have to uh, work it for a few days. But uh, I, I think I think there's there's potential upside there. I also think some of the some of the fundamental changes that are going on as well might might keep heating oil um, better bid than anything else at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's. If you think like we've been we've been in a range since July, so this this kind of we're into the third month of this quarter. We've been in a range of you know sixty, really sixty fifty two, an eight dollar range. So I'm amazed that Vega's holding up as much as it is doing at the moment. So it's you know, but if you actually then pull apart the number of days where we've had a two buck range. It's actually been, as we talked about earlier in the show, very volatile, as you said, Nick, very volatile, but range bound. It's kind of everyone gets and there's, no, there's zero trend to it. And, you know, after the sell off at Christmas last year, we, we had obviously the big push up. And then it really it's just been in a in a coiling spring, getting ready for the kind of fourth quarter chaos. So I, I position this could this could look like cheap play for the fourth quarter position, whichever you do. But skew wise. Upside RBOB is still cheap. Upside heating oil is still cheap. Um, that's what we're looking at. Well, I'd love to keep talking WTI. I know we could fill a whole show, but we, a lot of our, we have a broad spectrum of listeners on the show, which is one of the things that make it fun. And they're always hitting me up with ideas, different topics. I actually ran into one. He approached me at an event uh, yesterday. By the way, if you see me at an event, a lot of you guys will recognize the voice. Maybe you don't recognize the face because we don't do video, but you all recognize the voice usually and you come up to me. Don't worry. I'm a, I'm a happy, nice guy. You can come and give me your ideas, your suggestions, what you like about the show, what you'd like to see more of. We, we love that kind of feedback. One of our longtime listeners on this program, especially, I think it goes by T. Mal in our chat room there, did dust that yesterday at an event. It's always great to hear that feedback. He's pretty active in the ag options scene. And he was asking for some more ag options content. So I think we can accommodate that fellow. We also, I do believe, have a listener question along that same front 
Tenda. Tenda wants, can you do some deeper dives into ag options on the program? I love this show. There's really nothing else like it. Team Allen and others have brought up before, too. They're really, in a lot of things, breaking down the future side. In terms of the options, there really isn't a lot out there. So we love that you guys love it. We wish it could be seven hours, and we do every different product under the sun. That's a lot of time. Maybe talk to your broker. Maybe they approach us about a spinoff this week in Ag Options. How about that? There we go. What do you think, Mr. Nick? Should we do a spinoff? I don't know if Twyeo this week in Ag Options has the same ring as Twyfo. What do you think? Uh, I guess we could. Uh, we would be really uh, – we always – Fear the lean hogs, right, and the uh, and the cattle and and those things. I think we'd be pretty comfortable talking about the big three: corn, wheat, and beans. Um, I know that uh, there's a, a weird audi- a weird audience section out there that wants to talk about uh, class three milk, but this week in ag <laughs> options, we could we could we got to come up with another. Uh, we'll come up with another acronym for that. Yeah, Twyao. It clearly is demand. I don't know about the name, but uh. <laughs> I, I could think of a couple of nasty ones, but I'm going to leave those. For yeah, let's leave those off, off so we can we can keep yeah. our clean rating there in, in the yeah, iTunes. Yeah. So this is why I bring back Nick. He's going to get us booted out of the iTunes store. See you at this one week there. That's why he's the beloved curmudgeon. But let's start there. Soybeans making a lot of headlines. In fact, they were just a hair's breadth out of our top five in the movers and shakers this week. With the beans up 4.3%. 4.4% would have got them into the top five. No dice here this week. A lot of that moving, of course, a lot of big headlines in that space. The president just tweeting a few hours ago expected that China will be buying large amounts. Large amounts, exclamation points, of our agricultural products. They bought 10 boatloads, it was announced today, of U.S. beans, their largest purchases since June. That's, of course, remember we've said it many times here on the show, soybeans, kind of ground zero for the trade war there. Those purchases are expected to total about 600,000 tons. But, of course, that may be, it could be, too little, too late. A lot of pieces coming out, particularly for here around our neck of the woods here, Chicago, Illinois. A lot of soybean farmers here, as you might imagine, about 75,000 by some estimates. So a large chunk of the U.S. soybean crop coming from this vicinity. And a lot of them not exactly happy or pleased with this trade war. There have been a lot of articles coming out recently, including here in Chicago. People making allusions back to Jimmy Carter banning U.S. wheat banning Russia, I should say, from buying U.S. wheat. That embargo led to Russia growing their own and eventually becoming an exporter and did a lot of damage to our exports as a result. Some folks saying we may be seeing a similar thing playing out here in the beans, obviously with China saying no moss to the U.S. They've moved off to Brazil. Now Brazil has improved their infrastructure. They're growing a lot more, so there's more competition in that space now as a result. So a lot of U.S. farmers here are fearing that perhaps we've done some permanent damage to the soybeans as a result of this trade war. All that combining for some big upside overall, about 4.3%, hovering still shy of that 900 level, about 895 or so, up a whopping 37 handles this week. You know, Adam, it's been a while since we've done a deep dive into beans here on the show. We touched on some ags last week. Judging by our listeners, we need to do some more here on the show. But is this a popular product category with your users over there at Macro Hedge? Are they big Uh-oh. into the beans yeah. and the ags in general? Yeah, I think uh, uh, the, the, the beans, corn, um, they're, uh, they're really popular. They've got kind of a really solid community. Uh, there's good liquidity in all, in all of the products, so kind of everyone can get on them. And I, and I think you, you do tend to find that people specialize in them. Um, you know, and you know, whereas kind of whilst well, I've, I've got a kind of day job, we'll also be involved in, in everything else as well. These guys are kind of hardcore focused in, in their world, and, and there's, a, there's certainly a popular crowd. You can see that by the volume going through. But it's, it's interesting what you say. I mean, I, I, I saw the Trump tweet as well, and uh, I don't know, I kind of you know, if you I'm just staring at the moment at uh, a 30 day constant maturity corn call skews, and you know, you just you just you know fade, fading in uh, uh, fade, fading these Trump uh, announcements just seems to be a, a, a great play. But you know I'm fairly bearish. I think uh, I, I think the ags just get well. well I said I think you know soy, uh, uh, beans and corn just gets faded. And also I mean I just I'm just looking here, but you know with the, with the thing you said about the new orders recently, the t- the ten. Uh, ships of uh, of six hundred thousand uh, tons of soybean, but you look through. You only have to search the internet for the amount of times China has been cancelling orders. There was an order cancelled recently for five hundred and forty four thousand tons. It's quite. I think. I think these are. I think these are good, <clears throat> good opportunities. 
um, to, uh, to 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 fade, uh, and it looks already. You know, every single time we've seen these little jumps, that five and ten delta uh, uh, call side on the corn just gets totally overdone, and it just gets crushed four days later. Well, there could be something to that, definitely. I mean, uh, just you mentioning China does cancel shipments all the time. And on top of that, of course, there's a lot of talk about their local. They use it to feed their local hog population, and that, that population has been decimated by swine flu. So less demand there as a result as well. So a lot of interest. Mr. Nick, I know you're not a big ags guy, but a lot of your users are, including I think that listener at T-Mile, I think is a big user of Quick Strike. Anything catching your eye out there in the beans and corn this week? Yeah, I think what's probably... Um, most interesting, and, and I think um, when we started this show, that's when there was the, the heavy uh, rain pattern down in South America, and we had some really wide gaps in the in the quick skew. But um, and Adam, I don't think you mentioned this, but something that we can keep an eye on if we go look at the quick skew, which is going to be our sort of agnostic measure of how the call and put are related to at the money. These curves are super super flat between the twenty five deltas. Okay, so that basically means that the at the money and the 25 delta options are trading near or at the same volatility. So anytime, um, and, if you, and if you're listening or you have access or you can, you can go to the quick skew chart and take a look at the 30-day and the 60-day bean uh, quick skew charts. You're going to notice that they're basically converged around, um, uh, converged around zero or they're very, very close to each other and flat to each other. So it's pretty – some it's – it looks like some interesting numbers here and uh, probably worth taking a look at um, from, a, from a trade standpoint. Uh, other than that... Um, I, I, just, I, t- I just tweeted that uh, image. So uh, when uh, the, the, the Options Insider account, I, I just, I just so, so it maps, if people are, when people are listening back to this, just look for the tweets and that image is attached to the bottom of it. So help people walk them through. See, it's all symbiotic here. <laughs> on the show. But you're right, you know, that has been interesting to watch. I remember a few years back, Nick, when we were just kind of starting this show and we were doing a deep dive with your buddy, Mr. Nelson over there, who actually did see yesterday as well, talking about soybean skew and how it was, it was just set up perfectly for collars. We haven't really seen that, certainly not right now with that skew being so flat. We haven't seen that uh, lining up again recently. Looking here, what's lighting it up right now, as you kind of mentioned, the ball up interesting stuff out here the big print out here when we're threatening the 900 handle the big print actually looks like it was in the eight half puts out here in october in fact 38 percent of the paper going up out here in october this week a good chunk today not surprisingly given this recent announcement and developments seeing about six thousand going up today about three thousand plus going up wednesday and tuesday as well total of about fourteen thousand a lot of that opening Again, we don't know for sure about today's paper, but a lot of action on these eight half puts, which is kind of interesting. Maybe some other folks agreeing with uh, Adam here. Maybe it's time to fade this move because piling in on the eight half after a rally threatening 900 is kind of interesting. And then we also saw hot on his heels, number two here. Looks like actually it was some upside, and it was upside out here in November. It was the no about 11, uh, excuse me, 900 calls doing about 11,000 contracts out here this week the lion's share again today 6600 uh, again today and about 3200 going up on tuesday good chunk of that opening but again you don't know today's paper so i thought we'd see more action on the 900 calls we are seeing that but it's the uh, it's the eight half puts that are kind of dominating the action out here which is kind of interesting again maybe going back to what adam was saying earlier about maybe fading this rally and since our listener asked so nicely for some corn yesterday I, i'd feel bad if i didn't at least indulge him as well corn uh he was trying to make the point that corn and the commitment of traders has the has the most most people out there trading it right now it's the biggest dog out there at cme which is an interesting point not one we get to consider a lot here on the show i mentioned before i know a lot of people who've gone out from broad equity indices and gone into products like corn and, and done fairly well because you can wrap your head around it it has the liquidity across the term structure. The SKU is obviously going to be different, but if you can wrap your head around that, it's actually an interesting product with a lot of back and forth. Let's see what was going on here this week. The corn also up, but also shy of our top five, doing about 3.4%, so not quite enough to break it into our top five movers and shakers here. Up about 10 handles to 365. The vol, kind of a mixed bag, near portion of the term structure coming in. Longer term contracts getting a bit of a lift the big action coming here in Dece, actually, with nearly 40% of the paper coming up in Dece. Three half puts uh, was where the action was this week, doing 25, almost 26,000. Nearly half of that, almost 13,000 
going up today. So again, today was a big, big driver, big mover out here in ag land. The other big day was Tuesday with about 8,300. Uh, then we go off a little bit back here to actually to also the three half puts. So maybe a bit of a roll here. Look in here at October doing 22,000 there, about 13,000 going up today. So maybe a bit of a roll from October out to Dece. Either way, a lot of paper in these three half puts in October and Dece here doing 22, almost 23,000 in October as well. So near term, all the money puts. Adam, maybe this is kind of referring to what you were just talking about. We're seeing upside moves in both corn and the beans, and yet the largest options paper we're seeing on the surface could could be a bit of a fade. Are, are, you think they're buying what you're selling here, sir? Well, uh, yeah. I, 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 mean, I just think, you know, they've – I think once bitten twice shy, they've been bitten four times now, and I just you know you, you just you you just overlay the uh, five and ten delta uh, call, call school spikes to Trump's tweets, and it's fate of the century. Sounds like maybe you're not a believer in that vol fefe index that J.P. Morgan was touting earlier this week, where they're trying to make that volatility index of, of Trump's tweets, at least when it comes to ags. I, I think I, I love the volatility. I just from from a pure skew play. You know, we we just jump jump on the nerves and uh, and 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 unhappily sell into it. I think you get paid, but uh, um, you know, it's it, it's it's not as an exciting trade because you know you you you're kind of using that the the quick skew trade and you're 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 playing that term a little bit more. But I think um, yeah, it's just you know if we're, if you're if you're if you're here to uh, to make the cash and wait, it's a, it's a great trade. I, I do. You probably think it has got a bit more upside. I mean. You know, just just looking at a beans chart and looking at the, uh, you know, just yeah, arguably it's it will pop the top from uh, previous month high of what it looks like uh, eight ninety six, and you, you could see it a bit higher. But I just think still keep saying it's selling into that call skew. Speaking of that skew, let's break it down really quickly here in corn before we roll on some other products and get you guys here on the show as well. Like I said the most active contract was the Dece, nearly forty percent. Of the paper, so let's look at the skew out there, and it's kind of a little bit of a change, not a huge change out here. Uh, the puts getting a little bit more bid; they were nearly four percent cheap to the out the money, about three point eight. Now they're about two point six, so getting a little bit of a lift to the puts, and the calls were a little bit rich to the out the money, about five and a half percent coming in a little bit, about four point eight percent. So a little bit of a little bit of a change in the skew, and not a ton given some of the move out there. Maybe you might have expected a little more. Maybe some of that going back to reinforce what Adam was saying earlier that the folks are perhaps fading all this upside here and recently. Certainly some of the options flow could indeed be interpreted that way. I know you guys want a ton of ags. we got to keep on rolling. Stay tuned for the spinoff, Twyao, or whatever the heck we call it, <laughs> sometime, <laughs> sometime in the near future here. You don't um, want to know what we call it. Call it hashtag hog love <laughs> here on the show here. You guys love your, you love your lean hogs. Oh yeah, the lean. Let's, yeah, we've been looking at lean hogs recently. We're, we're waiting for a lean hogs or or any form of live animal expert to come and talk to us. Where uh, we've got some ideas, but we, you know, it's one of those things that's either you're either a complete specialist or know nothing about it. So yeah, we're staring at it, thinking, <laughs> "Ouch, we want to play, but it looks uh, it looks uh, it looks like the wild west that the, those products do." Some of the worst horror stories I've heard from, from guys I knew who were former, let's say, equity and index options guys migrating into futures options. You hear the great stories from the corn and the beans and things like that, certainly in the E-minis. You hear the horror stories and they get out into products like the Lean Hogs because it, you know, it trades by appointment. you got to know who all the players are out there. It has only a handful of hours in the day. The skew makes no sense. The flow makes yeah. no sense. You're, really, you're right. You really need to be a specialist in a product like that before you even attempt it. Yeah, you know, we touch on it here on the show every now and then because the listeners like it and it's kind of fun. But we don't even pretend to be specialists in the hogs or the or the livestock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah and there's just there's just not enough going through it to kind of really have any trust in the skew. And you know, we we trade off the skew and live off the skew. So you kind of look at it and it does. It's just all over the place. What would you say is number two for you guys? Obviously, your market makers and WTI is kind of where your bread and butter is. But outside of that, what's your what's your biggest product you guys are trading these days? Uh, ooh, um, it, it, it kind of just, I guess, gold, um, S P five hundred. Uh, we're all, we're literally, we, we do everything. I mean, we've we've never really got involved in stirs, but you know, the last few years talking to Nick, we do that a lot more. But we're we're just, you know, the, you can't. Outside of the kind of the day job, the key thing is you, wh- whatever we can find skew that's reliable and there's volume going through it, and we can get on. 
and we're we're looking at percentage return. You know, we'll we'll play. Um, that that that's the key for us. But you, you, you know, he's kind of we we follow where the bend is. <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. You know, and you mentioned equities. My buddy Sean out there, I believe, in Europe right now. But uh, stuff going on in his neck of the woods. He's obviously busy driving some flow out there in the Russell options. We'll get to that in a little bit, of course. Uh, today, at least, uh, coming into showtime, we saw most of the broad equity indices on rally mode on on hopes of a trade talk, on ECB easing a bunch of things, kind of contributing to that lift. So as a result... Markets in the green. We're seeing vol coming in kind of across the board. The VIX down over a handle, about 1.15 handles or so from last show. The volatility of volatility, though, is up. Remember, volatility of volatility doesn't matter. It doesn't track the direction. It just needs some movement. So that vol up about two, two and a third points from last show. And our old friend v, RVX, I should say, a.k.a. the VIX of the Russell 2000, that's off a bit as well, down to about 1870, off about one and a half handles, which means that spread which I like to talk about here a lot on the show, that VIX RBX spread is, is getting, getting pretty wide. It's about 4.65 or so, which puts it about as wide, a little bit wider than it was uh, last week. We usually see it hovering in that, you know, let's say, 2.5 to 3 or so range and seeing it now up north of 4. That's pretty attractive. That's when a lot of you guys are hitting us up saying, where are the vol products on Russell? I wish they were there. I wish RVX was trading, but at least you can quote it and see it. Maybe that's a good indicator, a good flag that, hey, maybe you need to start playing in some of the Russell options against Against the E mini options, it's like someone was up to that this week. We got a decent print here. It's all it's it's no matter what's going on. And Nick, maybe you noticed this too. I don't know, but no matter what's happening in the Russell this week, it's up. It's far out of the money puts that dominate the flow. About five thousand of the thirteen and a half puts going up in March of next year, uh, which is kind of par for the course. Any pick any week. Far out of the money puts is all anybody seems to care about in the Russell. But clearly got some action out here uh, this week. Let's see if we have similar paper out here in the uh, in the e-mini S&P out here. I don't think it's usually quite as biased on the only far out of the money puts. Let's see, e-mini S&P, of course, we broke through that 3,000 level not too long ago. Seems like number one with a bullet this week actually was upside. It was up here in uh, September, 30 quarter calls, 25,000 of those bad boys seem to be leading the dance this week. So a little bit of upside up here. I know, Adam, you guys like your skew trades. The equities don't have as much of uh, the sexiness, shall we say, of the skew. I know whenever I talk skew and equities with Nick, he gets very curmudgeonly because it doesn't change as much. Yeah, but. <laughs> I, I, but I think that said is that before we came on, I was talking to Hugh and I just said, so is, there any, is there anything lurking around? And, uh, um, and it looks like uh, Russell upside – some skews really, really cheap there. So I think uh, um, we, we're uh, we 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 we, will look, we actually kind of might even start looking at that uh, uh, mm-hmm. tomorrow. So uh, we'll we'll see. But that there's there's some I, I pro- probably look to kind of cover it off with uh, some ES VIX to, uh, to to cover that side. But certainly uh, those uh, those Russell those Russell uh, calls looking super cheap. Yeah, that's been a, a constant source of fascination for me is that all the paper we're seeing out there. And it kind of comes in fits and starts with some pretty decent sized prints like today, 5,000 lots and kind of quiet again. That Russell product still kind of getting its legs under it. But all the paper that is there is all on the put side. So leaves the calls kind of persona non grata. So if you're in there, if you're looking for some, maybe some cheap levels, maybe maybe Russell 2000 upside is the place to be. Mr. Nick, I know I have to drag you kicking and screaming into equities all the time, but Sean's not here, so you get to fill the footsie seat here as well today. What's catching your eye in the equities land, sir? Oh, I, I, I mean, I, I can't wait to hear about some of the Russell ideas that these guys have. But um, mostly just uh, want to mention, you know, when you're looking at these TWIFO numbers and you see uh, the volatility is decreasing, the, what you really want to pay attention to is we, it's really not changing that much. We're just, as we rally, we're moving along the vol curve. So remember, keep that in mind. It might show, it might show that uh, implied volatility has, has 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 been lowered, but the reality is it's just sort of sliding up and down the curve. And I think with all the things that are going on right now, the guys and I were talking about it uh, this morning. Um, you know, when when our when our uh, I hate that when our quote unquote leader says some things, the market gets a reaction. But I think the the consensus was that the reaction is becoming less and less, and and we're really uh, it's really not increasing the volatility. It might be moving the the underlying market, but the vol is just sort of 
sliding along its path. So for now, I don't think there's anything interesting going on from a volatility standpoint. Maybe see a little bit of, of a skew difference um, uh, uh, on, on one side or the other at the money. But from an overall vol perspective, we're not really doing all that much. Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking now at the Ru Russell path. And you're right, you know, kind of mapped pretty well to where everyone had it a few days ago. It's mapping okay. Corn's, the reason we kind of talked about corn as well is Corn's a little spike today has kind of uh, lifted the the slip slip slide shift slide a little bit uh, more. So there, there could be some even more value in chucking that out. But yeah, that Russell and the, and the ES is just plodded along as predicted over the last nine days actually. So it's kind of sweet. Congrats to the market maker there. All right, and maybe. Hopefully, we got some congratulations in store for you guys as well. Maybe you got some good questions. We'll see. It is time for your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for futures options feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider radio network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody. Welcome to your segment, the portion where you get to ask some questions. We already cheated, bumped up the question about the ags. Let's see how many more we can get to here. Love your questions. Keep them coming. You guys know how to hit us up. Let's go here. CLC. We're just talking about equity skew. CLC wants to know which contract has the steepest bid for puts in the S&P e mini. Well, Mr. or Mrs. C. LC, a lot of ways you can interpret this question. I'm going to go the straightforward route of just looking at how, what percentage bid to the add the money, which one has the highest bid there. And it actually just ticked up as we were just talking. It was looking like uh, October there in the E-mini. As you go farther out in general, CLC, the bid does tend to increase. People like their hedging. Right now, we're very top-heavy in the equity indices, so it makes sense. A lot of bid for these puts. But it looks like the actually week three in uh, in November here, just ticked up to 30.4% rich uh, to the add the money. So that seems to be, at least from our cursory glance here, to be in the winning category. Mr. Nick, do you concur with that, sir, or do you have, a, do you have an alternative suggestion? Uh, well, that's kind, of a, that's kind of a tough one. I would tend to look, if I'm going to answer that question, I might look at the counts of maturity and, and see which one has the highest... Uh, highest yeah it's um, a challenge there's a lot of ways to interpret this one yeah i mean for me i'm looking at the 25 delta and the 90 day looks like uh the highest the 15 delta um looks like they're all pretty much dead nuts uh dead nuts even um the five uh, the, let's see the 10 delta looks dead nuts even and the five delta does so when you start to consider, and then the five delta looks like the 30 day is the most expensive. So, and that's going to, to me, that makes sense because as you move towards expiration, you're going to get more of a bend in the curve in general. So, I would say that um, constant maturity is going to give you a better indication of just things in general. Things in general to me look like there's the 25 deltas richer in the 90s, but as you go down toward the fives, they're pretty much even in value, and then the five start to get a little bit bid uh, on the shorter end of the curve, So, which makes sense because you're moving towards expiration. So um, they're all pretty firm from a standpoint of a, of a percentage of volatility to the add to money. So, um, and again, to be honest with you, I never understand those questions because uh, it's it, does it really matter which one is the – I mean, it, it could very well be from due to illiquidity with a bad market. So that's why it's out there and high, and nobody has forced that market in. So I think you can't look at just a, you got to look at it across the term structure, and you got to look at the strikes around it. So, um, but my answer would be look at the counts and, of maturity. And, and I think, and I think the amount of vague, the amount of vague of per percent as well. So you know you can, you know that's that's the key thing. I kind of just just for the fact that the I'm looking at the mini ES. You know just the fact that the Zs 
trading uh, 20, uh, the 15 delta puts trading the uh, 22% of the Z and only 15% uh, for the uh, September is kind of you know it's it's largely irrelevant because you know the that 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 percentage gap against Vega gap just looking here you've got to do five contracts for every one Z contract so to, to balance out your Vega that's why these questions are good they're deceptively simple and yet there's so many different ways to interpret just yeah. this one thing like she was just saying yeah 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 so we just gave you three answers there CLC you got just straight up percentages which is kind of the straightforward <laughs> quick way you got the constant maturity 15 versus 25 delta like Nick was just talking or you have by Vega which puts it in a whole different light so hopefully we didn't confuse you more <laughs> but, I, you know I, I would always say with these things do it Vega by delta so check the delta out and, and load your load your Vega to, to the point hopefully CLC Mr. or Mrs. That helps. Even though Nick doesn't like your question, we still we still answer it here. We're we're charitable folks here on the old on the old show. Here, it looks like Adam. This is a good one uh, for you here. This comes from Mr. or Mrs. L 9 They want to know any recommendations for someone looking to maybe become a market maker or a specialist in futures options. Any firms or products? Any input would be appreciated. Keep up the fine work. Obviously, Adam, Nick, and I hung up our market-making hats a while ago, so you're the last of the Mohegans. You're out there still slinging it in WTI and others. What do you got to say here for Mr. and Mrs. L09? Maybe they want to jump into the fire with you, sir. Oh, don't do it. <laughs> I had a fear. How did I know you were going to say something like no, it's just, that? <laughs> just under no circumstances. Do it. It's just, you know, it, look, there's, there's a, I, I say, when I, I'm, we're doing a, uh, a training course at the moment, and it, there's a fascination with market making. It's just, you know, Nick and I and Hugh, we probably spend 90% of our time in the Q&A saying don't do it because one of the great things that the Merck's done is it's created so much liquidity in these key products that you can go and put on strategic plays skew plays or directional plays on 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 minute spreads you know the cost of getting yourself set up you know the ongoing data the infrastructure the fees it's 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 heartbreaking to start the you know the month 25 grand down just just on data fees and infrastructure fees so i would i would i would take every single benefit that you know the merc has put forward now for everyone to have such great liquidity in most products and put your mind to exploiting skew don't worry about getting run over for half a tick of Theo. <laughs> I think that's well said. You know, you're right. I mean, there's so many benefits now to being a customer or taking advantage of the liquidity that's out there. Why stand there and be on both sides if you don't have to? You can, you, you, one of the great things about the central order book is we can all throw limit orders in. So, you know, it's not like the old days where you've got to pay someone else's offer or bid. You know, just chuck it right in the middle, uh, right at Theo. And most people, you know, they're desperate for point one of a tick of Theo, they'll trade on you. So, you know, the, utilize it. The, the, the power is now with the, the, the consumer of, of those entities, no longer the provider. Nick, I'm assuming that you concur, sir. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, we, I, I'm always fascinated on how many people ask market maker questions and they haven't even really begun to start you know, even putting in orders in general. So, I mean, you can, uh, and I always, I always, well, what I've been saying, you could be a market taker. You don't have to be a market maker. Be a market taker. Create your market yourself. Figure out what you want your spread to be um, yeah. and and make the trade. And then, then you are, then you, now you're a trader. So you can be a trader or a market maker and a market, ta- you know, whatever, whatever you decide. But market making, it's tough business. I don't know how. It is. I mean, look at look at the names coming out of it. You know, there's massive names in Chicago, household names that that are pulling out um, because it's moving to it's moving. Uh, kind of after the global financial crisis, all the big banks they were all pulling out, and it dispersed everywhere. And there's like hundreds of people all over the place, all popping up. And now it's recentralizing. And you know, unless you're a, unless you're a super heavyweight. You know, it's it's not a space. You, you utilize the, the 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 ability that we have all got the same level of access and the same kit and the and the same ability to model a skew. Sit at home in your pajamas and take advantage of that. Yeah, you know, we've had some legends in the market making space over the years on the network, including Blair Hall. He got out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, it was him that's top of my mind actually. When I. Used to, you know, my 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 first jobs at Goldman when when uh, Goldman bought Hull, 
Uh, you know, he's, it was it was a kind of a weird thing. It was like a year ago, wasn't it, when he came out? Yeah, he came out, and I asked him, I said, would you want to get back in? And he said, God, no, the startup cost is going to be at least $20 million, if not more, and I just don't want to pay that anymore. I just had Thomas Petterfee not too long ago on the network as well. He, of course, infamously sold off Interactive Brokers, or not Interactive Brokers, sold off Timber Hill. He, he just laughed if I asked if he would ever get back in the business. So, yeah, learn <laughs> learn from those who have gone before you. It's rough water. These, these guys you're mentioning have got super deep pockets. You know, Most people are talking about kind of, Worrying about whether or not there are hundred k's worth of setup. These these guys have ultra deep pockets that can quite easily kind of throw in ten mil to get that set up properly. And they're saying no. That should be ringing alarm bells to everyone. That music hopefully isn't ringing alarm bells to you, unless you didn't like the show. Then maybe you're a happy camper. But that unfortunately, that music means we've come to the end of another epic sojourn through the world of futures options. It was a fun one as well. Touched on a lot of different stuff. Equities, your questions about SKU, becoming a market maker. Don't do it. Short answer there. <laughs> of course, got some got a little bit deeper into ags. Hopefully you guys appreciated that. We'll look into trying to rotate more ags onto the show in the future. And of course, WTI, you guys know it. You love it. You always want more WTI. No one's mad about that. So at least we can all agree on that. But before we go, let's go back around the horn. Let's start with you, Adam. If folks are intrigued by what you guys are doing over there, maybe they want to learn more. Maybe they want to reach out with questions about not becoming a market maker. <laughs> Where should they go? What should they do? Uh, if you want to reach out to us, uh, at MacroHedged on Twitter or MacroHedged.com. Um, contact us. You know, see what we're up to, see what we're about. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that'd be great. There you go. At Macro Hedged is the place to go. And you know him, you love him. He's the beloved curmudgeon of the futures options space. Before he retreats back into his curmudgeonry, Mr. Nick, sir, you guys are always working on cool stuff, new tweaks, new dark modes, new charts, all kinds of good stuff. What do you guys have up your sleeve over there in the land of Quick Strike these days? Uh, lots of good stuff. We're trying to work them into the delivery process here, so we'll be getting alerts out at some point and uh, some other ways to look at uh, – to look at old trades so you can maybe test uh, test the strategy out and see what it looks like. Um, also been working with the Macro Hedge guys to uh, with the options education course. So go out there at, on MacroHedge.com and take a look at what's available. It's, uh, it's going on right now, but all the course material will be available uh, as, an, as evergreen links. So um, take a look, because especially if you're new and you're looking for some things, uh, we talk about a lot of stuff each week. So... There you go. Check it out. And, of course, our buddy Sean couldn't be here. Head on over to FTSERussell.com at FTSERussell.com. Also on Twitter at FTSERussell. If you like all the data, you guys are always hitting us up about buy rights and strategies, premium harvesting, and the Russell 2000. That's the place to get all that data. If you want the vol products, the spread's widening out. Hit them up. S. Smith at FTSERussell.com is the place to go with your questions. And, of course, head on over to our friends at CME. CMEgroup.com slash TWIFO is the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires on the reports that we're talking about here throughout the show. And on behalf of Mr. Nick and Adam and Sean, who couldn't be here, and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in your questions. We love them. We, we don't make fun of them. We just, we just have fun with them. So, <laughs> Except for Nick. He makes fun of everything. But on behalf of all of us, we'll see you back here tomorrow for Volatility Views. That should be a fun one, a lot of vol in the equity space. And we do it all again next week, starting on Monday with the option block and rolling on into Thursday with a little bit more of this week in futures options. This week in futures options is brought to you by Quick Strike, options pricing and analysis software. Quick Strike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy to use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. Quick Strike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. Quick Strike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. That's B A N T I X.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Quick Strike One. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group. 
the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME Group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEGroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. 